And good morning, everybody. This is Jeremiah. We have an incredible webinar today on hardware recommendations. Um, we find, uh, you know, over the years, we only get asked more and more, uh, what do you recommend for this? What do you recommend for that? Is this laptop okay? And, and so on. And taking our years of experience of uh, administering, being a system administrator for many, many small offices, um, um, come to appreciate a lot of simple uh, upgrade strategies and budgeting techniques and uh, keep it simple sort of mindset with hardware. And anyway, so um, as some of you know, this has become a staple every year. We do this hardware recommendation webinar. And um, we are going to run through some pretty cool stuff. I have my little question box right here. Um, so do feel free to type in any questions. I'll be sure to, I have my Google fingers ready. So even if you're uh, wondering, oh, what about this model or that model or 512 gigs of uh of a SSD too big or too small, anyway, you, know, you know, those sorts of questions. I want you to feel free to type them to me. I'll get that answered and uh, um, we'll uh, get that over to Forrest and we'll talk about it anyway, all that sort of stuff. So feel free to type in any questions. Um, I think I've chewed up enough time with my yapper yapper yet again. So, uh, hey, uh, Forrest, you ready to take it away? Okay, hey, can everybody hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you great. Okay, sounds great. Um, yeah, so thanks for joining the webinar. This one's a very important one, as a lot of you know. Um, hardware recommendations. Basically, um, why do you need a new computer? You know, uh, that's a really powerful question. A lot of people think their old computer works just fine, but as we all know, computers are headaches. Um, uh, we're just going to go over a couple of quick things of some of the desktops that we've found, the laptops, servers, peripherals, and a couple of reminders to make sure you're backing up your data. Um, why do you need a powerful computer? Because uh, your time is money. Uh, you know, everybody knows this. Uh, all the processing time adds up. Uh, all the maintenance time adds up. Your average computer's average lifespan for your average computer is about four to five years, but a CAD workstation is less because there are more high-powered computers. Um, you know, for a, as an example, if your computer goes down, it's going to cost you about 150 bucks to get it serviced. And an entire day of not having your computer, uh, as far as what you're not able to produce work-wise, that can cost approximately $350, but on the flip side, if you bought a new computer every three years, that averages out to $3 a day. Um, so you just want to avoid those headaches, you know, let's all agree right now, we know this to be a fact, computers will fail, they will fail you, and so it's important to make sure that you're up and running and that you've got got a nice fast computer so that you don't have all those headaches. You can see right here this little chart that I found. You know, fast and cheap, that's not really an option. <laughs> what do we got here? Fast and good, that's expensive. You know, good and cheap, eh, it's going to be a slow computer. It's not going to be good for CAD. So this is where you want to be right there, where the dollar signs are. Unfortunately, you got to invest in your work. Um, AutoCAD is a resource hog just by the nature of the beast. Land Effects itself is a very, very minimally impactful program. That's a testament to some of Jeremiah's programming, um, but it doesn't require a tremendous amount of resources. But AutoCAD, however, does require a lot of resources. And um, oftentimes you hear when you're reading about specs for computers, you mostly just hear about the processor and the RAM, but often overlooked is the video card power. AutoCAD uses the video card extensively and pushes that thing to its limits. So that's a big bottleneck. You want to really think about the video card as well as the processor and RAM. And yeah, because LandFX is a plug-in for AutoCAD, you will need a powerful computer to run LandFX and CAD together. Um, 
This is some information that I found from Autodesk's website right here. Uh, eight gigabytes, that's what they recommend. They say four gigabytes minimum, but nobody wants four gigabytes of RAM. That's just bad news. So eight gigabytes recommended, or, you know, go big, get 16. Um, these are some of the CPUs that they were talking about on the Autodesk website. And if you look up the specs for these, you'll see that they're all nice, speedy, fast, modern CPUs. Chances are if you're buying a new computer, it's going to fall into one of these categories. And, and then, of course, they recommend a dedicated video card with at least one gigabyte of video RAM. So basically what we're looking at is a gaming level computer. If you go into the market looking for a computer and you'll see a lot of the recommendations that will work fine for standard office computers, um, but if you look in the gaming category of computers, you'll see these super powerful souped up computers and those are great for CAD workstations because the gamers also think about the video card and the processors. Um, so that's why CAD workstations are kind of cousins of gaming computers. And that also means that you can play a lot of games when you're at work and nobody's looking. Um, here's a couple of the desktops that we've found. Uh, and it seems like these are the big players in the in the game, you know, there's your the Dell and the iMac. Um, it seems that a lot of our clients have Dell computers and they make a really good product and this particular one right here, that one's got some good, uh, I mean it's obviously it's customizable and you can configure it how you like, but we've figured out that these, this particular one with these specs will run you about this much money. You notice it has a two gigabytes of dedicated video memory here for that video card. That's that's very powerful for what you're going to be doing. It's got the 16 gigs of RAM. It's got the solid state hard drive. You know what? That's not something that I mentioned earlier, but a solid state hard drive is really something that you'll want to consider <laughs> when you're purchasing a computer. It makes a world of difference. Uh, the power is just uh, tremendous. We actually had a computer here in our office that was not a solid state hard drive. We overlooked it when we purchased it and it was compared to all the other workstations that do have solid state hard drives. It was a snail so we went and got it swap, swapped out. We got a solid state hard drive put in it. Um, Windows 7 that's really key for a lot of you who are, I'm sure you know, a little bit leery of the Windows 8 movement. It's a little confusing. Um, this guy, I think this price, Jerry, I think this is priced with a 27-inch monitor, right? Yeah, I wanted to uh, make those, they make the two models as comparable as possible. Yeah, and also when you're buying a Windows computer, you want to consider budgeting for your security software and your service packages. You're going to have, you're going to need to have some maintenance done to it and you're going to need to make sure that you've got your antivirus software installed and all of that good stuff to keep it up and running. You know, after all, like we said, it is an investment, so you want to maintain it. Uh, think of computers as cars. you got to change the oil, you know? And then alternatively to that desktop uh, are the Apple iMacs. Uh, now, as you can see, it's got a lot of similar specs. Um, Fusion Drive is a hybrid solid state drive with uh, storage space on a traditional hard drive. Um, and of course, you'll have to buy Parallels and Windows in order to install PC software on there. Unfortunately for the world of AutoCAD for Mac, it's not going to allow things like Land Effects right now. So as an example, we have a good handful of clients using these super fast, awesome computers with Parallels and Windows 7 installed running FXCAD or AutoCAD on there and LandFX on the Windows side. You'll see that this is 
a little bit more money right here. That's priced out at these specs. Um, but and there's, you know, you know uh, in fairness with that price though, um, you know, that's the Dell XPS. That's off of their, you know, their gaming line, as you mentioned, their quote unquote workstation line with the Intel, Intel Xeon processors that, that Autodesk, uh, tends to recommend more, but frankly for 3D rendering in AutoCAD, which we're not doing. And that's why um, I did not pick a workstation with an Intel Xeon processor. But if you look at the, uh, you know, the, what would actually be a more truly comparable, um, a, a workstation class machine from Dell's website, it would absolutely be in that $2,500 uh, price range. Yep. So there's a couple of options there for people. Um, those are just some of the desktops that we found that we thought were awesome. And of course, I wanted to say that this is what we're using in the office. Now, if we look at laptops, there's a whole world out there of fast and high-powered laptops. Uh, here's a good roundup of the different things that are going on. Here is a gaming laptop. That's like we were talking about earlier. It fits in that gaming category. Um, this guy is high powered, fast there, fast there, fast there, solid state hard drive. Um, it's got that on it though. But uh, And so, you know, you're looking at about that much money and again, budgeting for security maintenance and things like that. And then here is a non- Man, you know, it's a gaming laptop or a w powerful workstation. This could be used for either one. Again, um, this one has this really cool feature where you can configure and customize that keyboard. That's kind of that's kind of nice. I, I hope more and more people start doing that. But you can see these specs as well: speedy, fast, um, and similar price point. And then, of course, there's your Apple option. Um, this guy jumped a little bit in price in the last couple of weeks, I think, with some of the newer features. But uh, all of these laptops are all in the same category as far as fast and high-performance video cards, uh, which and are... You know, I, I am you know, I'm just so impressed with that MSI laptop. I kind of want to hear of somebody buying one and <laughs> tell me how it is because it's got, you can see it's got the numeric keypad on there, which is very hard to find in a 15-inch laptop. That three gigs of video RAM is incredible. Uh, I mean, the thing is just a really, really incredible laptop. So, uh, you know, I mean, that one is definitely my current go-to recommendation. Nice. Oh, and Jer, I think I forgot to include in here your first laptop. Oh yeah, and I, I as a point of comparison, um, I looked up the specs of my very first laptop, which was a Toshiba Protege from uh, way back in the day. Yeah, there you go. Look at that. Uh, back in uh, <laughs> that was Windows. Or that was uh, 1997, I believe, roughly right in there. Um, but I, you know, so I adjusted the specs. So a Pentium 133. That's point. 133 gigahertz, uh, 0.032 gigabytes of RAM. Uh, look at that. It was still light. That's what's amazing, you know. Um, but uh, that was a list price of $3,500 back then, which translates to uh, over $5,000 in today's money. So uh, I, I particularly thought that would be a good, somewhat relevant point because a lot of people seem to have the sticker shock, uh, uh, particularly on the, the Apple computers. But, um, you know, the first three laptops I bought, in you know 90s and early 2000s were all over 2000 comfortably over $2000 uh, and uh, they were just clunkers with tiny little screens i mean this uh, this macbook pro i have now is just an amazing amazing machine <laughs> and uh, chances are it, it's unlikely that in 10 to 20 years your macbook pro will be a doorstop like this one is um we also looked at a series of server options for small to medium-sized offices. Obviously, larger offices have dedicated 
servers and racks of Dell machines. Um, but for your small and medium-sized offices, um, I'm sure you've heard us say this before, but we recommend that you run a server even if you're running two or three people in your office. If you have <coughs> multiple computers, we believe it's absolutely imperative that you have a server on site. You can keep all your files in one location and then um, you can back all the files up from your central file server and it just takes the headaches out of a lot of equations. Computers go down left and right, but you've got a dedicated server where all your stuff is and that's being backed up, then you can sleep a little bit more soundly. Um, these are some of the options that we found. Uh, we're particularly enamored with that QNAP. Um, it's, you know, it's fanless, it's quiet, uh, it's a nice little box. It's, it does have this really cool feature where you can, uh, through a web browser, access your files on this QNAP uh, remotely. So that's really, really handy. It's got a USB backup so you can plug it into your backup drive. And uh, it's about that much money uh, for the whole shebang. We do have a handful of clients running land effects from this machine and I have a separate webinar that we've done that shows how to configure land effects on this. It is a little bit a little bit tricky. We tried to make the webinar as easy as possible so you, you'll be able to get through it and install Land Effects and configure it and get it up and running. Um, the Apple Mac Mini is another great option. Uh, they used to have a server model but now they just sell the Mac Mini and then upgrade the server software. Um, and as you can see that's a nice fast computer as well and it has that built-in time machine backup system which is great. We've used it, uh, this is what we have in our office, and I've used that time machine a couple of times to track down some files that we lost here or there. You know how that happens. Where did that file go? Somebody deleted it and it's missing. Well, the time machine system is so nice. You open it up, there's a really easy graphic interface. You go find the file, pull it out, and boom, you're done. So that is nice. Um, and of course, we've got, whether you have this or this, we've got it plugged into one of these fireproof, waterproof backup hard drives. This thing's awesome. It's a little pricey, yeah, but for what you're doing with it, that's, that's amazing. Uh, we've got our time machine backups generating automatically to this hard drive, keeping all of our data safe and intact. So that is absolutely awesome. you got to get one of those. This is also absolutely imperative that no matter what machines you have in your office that you have it hooked up to a uh, power supply and not just a, uh, a power strip that has a surge protector, an actual you know universal uh, power supply. I'm spacing on the acronym but, um, but that's very important. Uh, Jerry you had something to say about that. Oh, a, a couple things. You know that uh, you know I've just I'm such a big fan of of battery backups. You know I actually have a, a trip light rack mount UPS um, in my living room, um, so that when I get a brownout, it doesn't make my uh, PlayStation or cable box have to restart. It's really you know, <laughs> so uh, they're just really great to have. Um, and um, uh, so certainly for your server. Uh, equipment back there get at least a 1500 volt amp like that um, you know you might want to go you know double that price um, you know it's all about how much time you want you know when the power goes out you know your, your most common power outage um, is actually uh, like I believe it's like 30 seconds to a minute is that the most common um, and you know then your second most common is the one that's uh, under an hour and, and so but you just you want to give your people time enough to decide you know uh, do I save the file I'm working on and if I'm working on something online like a Google Doc or something so that's why um, I recommend always of course plugging in your router your your internet modem should always be plugged into a UPS battery backup so that way the power could go completely out and everybody in the office goes oh, oh okay well let's send that last email or whatever and then shut down you know um, that uh, 
fireproof uh, safe uh, drive, by the way, that's the four terabyte model, which is a little newer. That's why it's um, um, over 500. The one and two terabyte models are less than uh, half that cost. Um, so um, I just was grabbing that one for a more typical, uh, say, three to five person office. Um, that four terabyte sounds a little more capable for, for time machine purposes. Nice, nice. I'm just going to move over and we found a couple of really fun things to put in here as far as peripherals go. This is the kind of keyboard I use because I'm careful about my wrists and ergonomic stuff. Uh, there are really cool gaming keyboards out here with illuminated keys and easy to type. You know, you're using a lot of keyboard commands. Uh, Jer found this really cool mouse with a couple of key buttons there that could be configured for AutoCAD. And again, these are gaming equipment right here. But because you're doing a lot of work in AutoCAD. Uh, what was it that you had the mouse button set up as, Jer? The uh, forward mouse button is escape, and then your back or, or thumb button, your forward thumb button is escape, and then your back thumb button is delete. And that's uh, thanks to my dad. He's the one who came up with that and swears by it. And, and he found an old Microsoft uh, seven button mouse and bought a case of like 20 of them that he still uses to this day. <laughs> Wears them out and then gets the next one. But uh, that's, yeah, they have gaming mice up into like 18 buttons. But um, when you count the buttons there, that's a six-button mouse. Um, that, that is really handy for AutoCAD. That uh, There's another button behind the mouse wheel. You could have that be uh, a regen all or something would be kind of a handy one there, um, something like that. Um, but uh, um, especially having escape, um, it's amazing how much that frees you up from having to always uh, have a thumb over the escape button, or your, your, your left thumb over the escape button there. Instead, just use the escape button on your mouse. And we found this cool little uh, number keypad this morning. That's that uh, Apple trackpad that's like that touch screen, uh, basically the little part on the laptop, but uh, side peripheral. And somebody came up with a great idea to put that film over it so you have it as a number keypad. So if you are using one of those iMacs and a normal uh, Mac keyboard that doesn't have the number key, you can use one of those. It's just a cool idea. We just thought it was neat and threw it in there. Um, and this is important. I just wanted to reference this uh, when you are considering getting new hardware and doing this whole thing. You want to really keep in mind some of these key concepts for backing up your data. You know, we have we have thousands of clients, and at least once a week, typically twice a week, uh, or more, people are calling us and saying, you know, my computer crashed, or my hard drive crashed, or my Windows is corrupt, and I had to reinstall everything. And we always ask, so do you have sound backups? And I'd say about two-thirds of the time now they say yes they do and they get everything up and running and it's all good to go but there are those occasions where people call and they're a little bit freaked out because they lost all their data and this the, I can't stress this enough this is so important uh, so this is a 3 to one backup concept you'll see this is pretty common as just kind of a rule of thumb something to consider so the three is for three copies of your data Here's an example would be one copy on your off-site hard drive, one copy on your local external hard drive, and one copy in the cloud. Uh, we have so much data here that our third is a USB stick. We have these um, high-capacity USB sticks. That's our third one. Uh, the two is for two different types of formats example hard drive and cloud just so that you know that if one format fails you have this other format and of course one off-site your monthly external backup in like a fire safe or a safe deposit box so here in our office of course we have our three copies of our data we have our our server we have the backup fire safe hard drive and then we have um, the off-site hard drive, 
uh, the two different types of formats. We have a hard drive and the USB sticks, and that one monthly offsite that we uh, do regularly. And I'll tell you, our server went down, what was that, about a month ago? The hard drive started acting up. So mm -hmm. we went out and got the hard drive replaced. And in the meantime, we pulled up our backup data on one of the other office computers just so we could access it. And we got it back with the next day or so, and we put all the data back on and up and running like nothing ever happened. So it's just absolutely imperative that you really consider this concept as a rule of thumb. It'll help you in the long term. Um, anticipating anybody asking about any of the cloud backup services, there's your classic Dropbox. It's $100 a year for 100 gigabytes. And that's, you know, that's not that bad compared to new hard drives and data loss. You know, it's a good option. It's really easy to use, and that's really key because uh, some of the other big players in the game, Google Drive, it's, you know, yeah, that's great and all, but it's not as easy to use as Dropbox, so that might be something to consider. And, of course, these other companies, if you wish to look into it. Um, and maintenance is important. So, like I said, think of a computer as a car. you got to keep the oil changed. you got to take it in for your regular checkups, make sure everything's working right, change all the fluids, um, and keep it clean. So, computers are the same way. Make sure you're running all your Windows updates. Um, we've actually seen that a couple times, too. Someone will call in and they'll say, hey, FXCAD, LandFX, it's not working right. And we'll say, well, run all your Windows available updates. And they'll pull it up. And at some point in the past, they had turned the automatic updates off like months ago. So their computer is months behind. And there'll be, you know, 60 gigabytes worth of updates or whatever. And it'll take an hour and a half to install. And then everything works. So that's just something to think about is making sure you have those on. And you can turn those to... Um, automatically check and then you get to tell it when to install. I would recommend that setting in Windows as opposed to the automatically download and install whenever they're available because that's where you get that problem where you just go to restart your computer real quick and it automatically installs the updates and takes an extra 20 minutes so that's really key. Um, there's all this stuff out there there's your what they call crapware. I guess that's kind of a rude term. Bloatware and what have you. That's the stuff like when you go to uh, download a free program and the installer installs all this third party junk on your computer. You know, we see the funniest things in people's computers and they're the uh, add remove program list. The best was the search donkey. Search donkey. <laughs> <laughs> but there's all that stuff in there. Go through and uninstall that stuff. You know, if you go to, let's see if I can pull this up real quick. If you go to your uh, control panel and you go to uninstall a program and you just quickly scan up and down this list and you see anything you don't recognize, you know, maybe do a quick bit of research on it and get rid of it. All that stuff is bogging down your system or potentially harmful, too. So as you can see here, this is a real streamlined. It just has the basic Microsoft stuff. Uh, there's that. There's uh, the program I used to log into your computer remotely and LandFX and FXCAD, and that's basically it. So make sure you, you know, keep an eye on this stuff in here. Um, let's see here. Uh, and making making sure you're doing some basic operating system tweaks. The classic example is to disable this feature in Windows 7 by using the basic Windows theme. And that's real easy to do. You can just right click on the desktop and click personalize. And there's Windows Basic right here. Now what that does is that disables a lot of the fancy performance aspects that might bog down your computer. It's a little unnecessary and you won't notice a difference. There's a lot of great little operating system tweaks you can find online. And AutoCAD performance maintenance. Uh, that has to do with your video card drivers and these specific updates in the Windows update system. Um, also, I forgot to put here service packs if you're using 
your standard AutoCAD. Make sure you have the latest service packs installed. Autodesk is constantly patching bugs and tweaking the software and they push out those updates. So make sure you have those installed. Those are all very, very important things to think about. You have anything to say, Jer? You know, I would, uh, from you know my experience with with uh, just so many computers and and of installing and maintaining and transferring and over and over, the the procedure I've done, which I would highly highly recommend, is when you're setting up a brand new computer. Um, I always just start a text file because it's a brand new computer. Who knows what you have? So I open up Notepad, you know, and everything I do, I. I, I I write down every piece of software I install. I never install off of a disk. Um, I all, or I never install off of the downloaded folder. If I download the file off a disk, I copy that to the server and install it from there. And then write my little text file what I installed. If it needed a code key to activate it, log that. So what you end up with when you do that is you end up with a log of all the software you installed, all the settings you changed, all your code keys that you need. And all of that is on your server, which is of course backed up doubly and triply. And so the next time your uh, computer dies, uh, the next time you get a new computer, or the next time just for whatever reason, um, you know, even with, uh, with an Apple and having parallels, it's a much simpler Windows image because all we really have installed on the Windows side is not a lot. You know, that just FX CAD is, is what we typically, that's all we install on, on the Windows side. So if we have to, gosh darn it, reinstall Windows and rebuild that PC image, there, there's not a lot that we have to do. But you can see this is like what we do. We have a list of every single little thing that we do. Um, and, and that is really almost as important as anything else because a lot of people have uh, understandable trepidation about buying a new computer because they have to go through all that again. Well, if you have the list of everything that you did from last time, uh, it makes that process go a lot quicker. Yeah, that's right. And we have um, we have all of these big pieces of software sitting on the server. Um, and then, of course, some of these are just downloadables. Um, and all of these logins we have in our password manager. So it's all organized. It's all tidy. We have that all dialed in, just like Jer was talking about. It makes life a lot easier. Um, and you really shouldn't be afraid of reinstalling your operating system that's Operating systems get tired. The windows will just get tired and old and haggard. And it's okay to reinstall everything from scratch. You'd be amazed at the performance difference. Uh, if you have a Windows installation that's four years old, that's too old, you know, or the computer's too old, really. But uh, And that, that goes for any computers. Like I said, uh, computers will get tired no matter what. Uh, there was a um, one of our iMacs in here that uh, an employee was using. It went through three different employees, and then when this third uh, person left, we just reinstalled the operating system from scratch. And, you know, that's a great thing to do. Um, so don't be afraid of that. If you have your list, you have it all organized, that's, that's the way to go. Um, let's quickly look at what's going on in our office. And there's a bunch of funny people who work here. Um, we have a combination of iMacs and MacBook Pros. We have that Mac Mini server with the Time Machine running to the File Vault backup drive. We all have Parallels and Windows 7 installed. We prefer Windows 7 here. Uh, it's a little easier to navigate. Um, Time Machine, the manual backups of the parallel images. That's really awesome. Um, we had that happen a couple of times here where Windows will get all weird and tired or corrupt or not working correctly. But we have this file. It's just a one single file on your computer. It is, uh, let me pull it up here. All right, so you can see this right here. This is the Windows that I'm using right now. It's just one file. I take that file and I have it backed up in two different locations right now. Fortunately, I don't use that. I can just swap it out. But I already have uh, FXCAD installed on it. And then I can stop Parallels. I can take this file. I can copy it. I can put it on my external USB or my hard drive. And then if 
Windows fails, I just delete that file and I replace it with my backup. Start it up and everything's good. No downtime at all. So that's the number one reason why we love using Macs here is because with Windows issues, we don't experience any downtime. And we have all our backup procedures in place and we're just back up and running all the time. So that's why as, as people who work uh, in the tech industry dealing with computer issues on a regular basis, we didn't want to experience any of those issues for ourselves in our office. So that's just why we do it. And I understand that not a lot of people uh, might prefer the Macintosh operating system or they might not want to try something new and that's totally fine. Um, a lot of those fast Windows machines are great too. But that's why we use Macs in here. It works for us, for our needs and our purposes. Mm -hmm. And you know what uh, Crystal has reminded me of is, uh, you know, they don't have uh, AutoCAD and you know installed down at the Apple Store, and so for those of you who have not, you know, familiar with that, you know, it's hard to test drive it. If you are coming to the ASLA Expo in Denver, uh, we are going to have our setup there where we are going to have a couple of MacBook Airs with FXCAD and LandFX on them. Um, for people to just walk up and try out and you'll be able to see that even on a MacBook Air uh, it, that's actually a pretty nice machine I wouldn't you know we wouldn't recommend it for a production CAD uh, laptop for a trade show display laptop it works great um, but to get a feel for how AutoCAD and, and SketchUp and all that comes together on a Mac uh, machine um, that is going to be at the trade show so um, feel free to stop by our booth and try that out and if you do come by our booth, don't forget to come to our party. I just wanted to give a little shout out there. Uh, ASLA Denver is going to be a great time. Come by and have fun with us. Um, but uh, it looks like we've come to the end of our presentation today, Jeremiah. Is there anything else uh, you wanted to say? I want to remind people to type in some questions. We've got a couple questions that would be nice to run back over on uh, laptops. Um, Steve wanted to clarify the, uh, the solid state size versus the hard drive size. And uh, what I mentioned to him is, uh, frankly, I would never want a mechanical hard drive in a laptop just ever. So for instance, that MSI, I, if I was buying that, I would upgrade that to just a bigger solid state, to a 256 gig solid state. Uh, it is long since the time I would ever want a, a mechanical drive on a, on a, on a laptop. Uh, in terms of a desktop, frankly, it's the same. I would rather have a 256 gig solid state on every desktop and have all my large storage uh, on the server. Um, but, uh, you know, certainly you can, you know, have obviously all these terabytes on, on a machine. I just, if it, it freaks me out personally <laughs> because something goes wrong or it gets stolen or something and there goes 14 years worth of photos, you know. Um, and then uh, we had a bunch of questions from Jeff on servers and, and that's an interesting one and I think um, I don't, you know, maybe oh, some thoughts that maybe you have, Forrest, but he is kind of wondering uh, between, you know, having Mac server running the Active Directory services and if we've had any experience with that um, versus, of course, a Windows uh, server um, running those services. And um, I personally don't have any experience with that. I know I just personally don't like um, Active Directory because it requires a DHCP server and a DNS server and it's just a, a nightmare of configuration and the oh, the OS X uh, server utilities is so much easier and 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 like I've mentioned many times like you mentioned for us it, you know in all my experience the most common a thing I've ever found to be uh, in, a, in an office, the most common uh, support issue is like you said, is tracking down a file that got either misplaced or deleted or overwritten with a bad version. And uh, Time Machine handles that so perfectly. And uh, Microsoft has uh, that one server add-on, I can't remember the name, that does it, but it's hard to find and it's overpriced and it's just a, a nightmare. Um, so, but do, do you have, have you heard anything about the Active Directory services for a Mac? Uh, no, I've just, I've read a little bit about it, and if you're interested in using 
that Active Directory, you're going to want to go with a Windows-based server box. That's pretty much how that goes. And um, Jimmy um, asked about touch screens. And um, I think it's a great question. I haven't had a lot of experience other than I did see at a uh, at a trade show someone had one of those uh, gateway 24-inch uh, touchscreen all-in-one computers. And for a, a trade show display, that was pretty amazing. I, I was pretty impressed with that. I don't know if that would uh, be so uh, helpful. Um, one of those laptops, though, that there does remind me, I think the MSI laptop, if I remember right, was actually a touchscreen. Um, so that's, I, I just, I can't remember if you, if, we look at someone, if someone wants to, I, I said I had my Google fingers ready and I didn't even Google that real quick. Um, but um, there, there was, it could have been that one, or it was one of those gaming notebooks, uh, the screen was a touchscreen as well. And, and it just seems to me to be a little bit of a novelty more than anything, but I can understand if you're mobile, you don't have your mouse out, things like uh, dragging uh, something um, in AutoCAD or resizing without a mouse just on the little touchpad are a little cumbersome. And so on a touch screen, uh, that might be uh, a little more better, but um, I still think it would be a little too much of a novelty for a production machine. Yeah, it's not so much geared for robust production work. Uh, we have have had a couple of clients install FXCAD on like Surface tablets, and those don't have any dedicated video memory, so they they fail in performance right there. Um, and then of course, inside AutoCAD in a Windows environment on a touch screen on one of those tablets, it's just not really ideal for that. Um, and on one of the, on those bigger monitors that are touchscreen, like I believe Dell makes like an iMac style computer with a touchscreen, that might be good. But we we haven't had any uh, any any people that we've come across using touchscreen as a primary interface for production work. It just doesn't seem like it's set up for that. But you know, we're you know, give us your feedback. Let us know if that's if that's working for you. And then uh, uh, one last thought, Jeff had just more input that um, they've just had networking issues. They've had the SMB2 problems uh, with a, a, a Mac Lion server. And so um, uh, he said his their fix was to downgrade SMB1, um, but now SMB3 is out and he's just um, in a bit of a quandary. And, and that's definitely um, a, a very valid point is that if you, you know, we're talking about uh, networking from a, a Windows, a virtual Windows running inside of Parallels, uh, connecting to a, a, a Mac server. And what we found here in our office is we map all of our network drives to the, uh, to the Apple uh, network share that is created by Parallels. Um, and, and that has been far, far, far more stable than mapping a drive to uh, the actual Apple share from the Windows virtual image to the Apple share. And I, I don't know if that was, if I stated that clear enough, but um, there are certainly networking issues. Um, so that is why back to that QNAP server, that is an incredible box for, you know, the vast majority of our users are one to three, one to three person offices. That QNAP server would save so much headache you would not believe, and that is a very reasonably priced box. We're not a server is not a five thousand dollar machine anymore. Um, that QNAP box is just nothing more than hard drives and the interface, and it's able to run uh, MySQL database. is able to host Land Effects. It has that uh, remote file access. Has everything. Um, it has just a very simple web-based uh, interface to set up your uh, file permissions and I mean, it could even do stuff that you would really, frankly, almost never do, like connect a printer to it, stuff like that. Um, but I, I definitely recommend checking that out, especially people who, you know, we have a lot of people who are saying, oh, we don't have a server, we're just using Dropbox. But then we ask, okay, where's your secondary copy besides, you know, on your two laptops? And, and 
they don't. And so even if you're using Dropbox, I would still recommend something like that QNAP box to store your many, many gigabytes of project photos and everything else. Having a cheap little server like that is a very, very good addition to a small office. Yeah, and, and we figured out our networking woes a while ago, and everything's working really smoothly uh, from our virtual parallels machines. Um, and so everything's here, and it's all dialed in. Um, that was a while ago, so I don't recall if it was that exact same issue. And that's the that's the thing that you want to consider when you're thinking about these things. If you do decide to go to Mac, you want to think about the fact that there's a bit of a learning curve and some technical things that you'll need to deal with. But that's you have to deal with technical things and learning curves no matter what computer you get, what piece of software you end up starting to use. So it's just something to to kind of bundle in, like you're going to have to deal with some configuration things and some, uh, you know, troubleshooting. Well, and I think uh, that's pretty much it. We're going to have this uh, posted and uh, we'll also on our hardware recommendations page, we'll um, put out the actual models that we, that we configured here um, so you don't have to wade through the, the PDF to find which ones we, we recommended. So get you guys all geared up for the Black Friday sales out there and for our Black Friday sale as well. Um, and uh, um, I got nothing more. You want to sign us off for us? Yeah, I've got nothing else to say. Thank you. Uh, thanks everybody for tuning in and uh, have a wonderful weekend.